Thank you for the introduction. Delighted to speak about organizational vigilance. Uh, there is a great need for that at the moment. I'm basing my remarks on a book that I wrote with George Day from Wharton called Seeing Sooner and Acting Faster. It's about vigilant leadership. And so um, in the next 30 minutes, 40 minutes, uh, I'd like to cover sort of the basics of that perspective. First of all, vigilance is of course about being mindful, being aware of what's happening around you, but it's also about acting on some of that information. Um, and some companies do this better than others. Uh, some who clearly benefited uh, from vigilance would be Nike becoming a leader in the online you know, customer engagement uh, field, if you will, and being a pioneer. Adobe was very successful. There's a whole bunch of others, which uh, I don't think we need to go into deeply, but Philips, uh, the electronics company, uh, was a leader in LED, but in getting out of the business, it's not always that you see the opportunity. It could be that you recognize the threat. And because they had studied LED carefully, realized they could not compete with the Asian low-cost producers and becoming more of a commodity. So they exited that particular business before GE did and before uh, um, Sylvania did in the United States and also globally. Uh, and had much better terms for selling their, you know, lighting assets and are much more focused on healthcare at the moment. But mostly uh, people uh, want and like vigilance in terms of being aware of opportunities, but the threat side, you know, mitigating threats, seeing them sooner, of course, that can also be very important. Um, the cost of not being vigilant, not being able to see much around the corner, well, can be very high. I have some well-known examples. Wells Fargo obviously was very slow to catch this internal problem. Sometimes the threat is from within. Same happened, of course, to Volkswagen, you know, trying to manipulate uh, their exhaust tests. Kobe Steel um, didn't uh, manipulate quality inspections and didn't see it soon enough. So there's a whole question about who in the firm knows it and who is willing to share it and who is not. In our book, we cover a lot of examples of people having missed, as well as seen opportunities. But on the missing side, the threat or the opportunity, we couldn't find one case where there wasn't somebody in the organization or their extended network who was not aware of it. So it's more a question of distributed knowledge, not getting to the people who can act on it. And some of these cases are very complicated, like Facebook, and they have multiple challenges, as you know. So why is that happening? But it's, of course, very telling when Sheryl Sandberg, the COO, uh, in dealing with the early issues of people, you know, um, using their platform for all kinds of nefarious ends, when she said, we were too slow to spot this, to, too slow to act, that's on us. So more power to her for admitting this. And I think that if you just look at uh, results about why people get terminated or what companies think in terms of how good they are at this, a sample of corporate strategies that was done, um, two thirds of those responding said they were surprised by high impact events, um, at least three of them over the past five years. And an interesting one done with uh, corporate directors said that they had terminated CEOs for denying reality. Uh, another 30%, 31% had to do with mismanaging change processes or 28% ignoring customers. Just to find what we really mean by seeing weak signals and the periphery better, here are some examples that I think seem innocuous. Uh, an example would be your sales manager in the Asia Pacific region Here's a rumor about a potential competitor that is picked up somewhere in the enterprise. Well, how do people know what to make of that? There is an overload of signals and you need to put some filters on it, otherwise it gets to be uh, an overwhelming task. Uh, an, aggrieved, an aggrieved customer posts a, a blog uh, and that is read widely. Well, how should that be forwarded? Uh, you hear that an RFID tag uh, is being implanted under the skin somewhere and you happen to be in a business where that matters. And is this an opportunity? Is this a threat? Does it foreshadow uh, regulations, uh, et cetera? And most of the problems that we are in the newspaper are actually about people having missed. And what I find striking 
is that when these the leaders of these companies are interviewed, these could be the CEOs, they often said, I have no idea. And often these reporters don't ask the next logical question. So why did you have any idea? Isn't that really your job to at least be highly aware of what's going on? So it is a, it's, it's challenging issues. We think the problem is that, well, most managers are very good at focusing and they focus on, you know, operational tasks. They focus obviously on customers, on next quarter sales, moved by competitors. It's all very good stuff. But we also know that if you focus, you pay a price, whether you realize this or not, you restrict your peripheral vision. Uh, many of you have seen and participated, I hope, in that famous uh, video where, you know, a basketball is moved around by one team with white shirts. And there's another team that has red shirts that also moves a basketball around. And you're asked to count how often the white team passes the ball. And it's, it's not simple because a lot of movement, lots of players. Um, and in the meantime, as you're counting, and a fellow dressed up, or a lady, I don't know who, in, an, in a gorilla outfit, walks slowly through that scene without disturbing anything of what's going on, but does turn around to the camera, pounds the chest, and leaves the scene. And when we show this in executive education programs, before it was widely known, when it was still a novel demonstration, uh, I would ask two questions. Uh, how many people got to count right? In the example we used, it was 14 times the ball was passed. And I would say about 60, 70% get that right. And then we would ask, of course, did you see a gorilla? And about half the people would say they would. And then the real interesting subset of participants are ones who got both right, right? You want really in your top leadership, people who can count, to take that more you know, trivial example, but who can focus because a lot of in business is about focus. But also you want people who have that capacity when they, while they focus to have peripheral scanning capability. And as you know, the human eye to use that example has two different kinds of cells, you know, these rod cells and these cone cells, the rod cells are more near the iris. That's good for focus, for color, for detail. Then there's the rod cells that those are really sort of motion detectors. And I can turn my head if I see something moving right or left. Organizations do not turn their heads very easily. And it is, and, and the human eye, by the way, has 10 times more rod cells and cone cells. So that tells you something about evolution, what, what is important. Peripheral vision is in that sense more important than focal vision. Sure, it's important to get the last piece of meat from that carcass in now primitive earlier stages, but noticing that shadow behind you that's gonna have another meal, including yours and your prey, that's obviously uh, even more important. So this is uh, not always easy to do in sports. If you play, I think many people play sports, of course, it takes a long time in tennis to see both the ball, but also keep an eye on the opponent in, in soccer or in hockey or American football. It takes years to develop this ability to see the ball and see the field at the same time. And it requires often switching back and forth between these two modes of uh, observing things. So let's talk a little bit about what the challenges are for organizations to, uh, to get good at that. Let's start by what the problem really is. Um, was one observer uh, who I quote here noted, a lot of what happens in organizations and is crept into it in big companies in particular is a strong internal focus, high bureau bureaucracy, uh, PowerPoints, including mine, of course, and that becomes the antithesis if that is the dominant mode of uh, communication and conversation of, of agility, of mindfulness. So there is an organizational vulnerability that happens, and it's partly not only internally caused by short-termism and an inside-out mentality, people thinking about how do I play my hand better, not thinking about what necessarily is needed in the outside world, but trying to further enhance your current uh, business model, a lack of curiosity. It's not sure people are cre promoted for being curious, maybe, unless as a result, maybe. Um, maybe poor information sharing to where it really needs to go, weak leadership. Uh, and Alvin Toffler in the 1970s wrote, of course, a great book called Future Shock, which was not so much about companies, but society. But he argues that uh, there is a certain amount of so much ha change is happening even then uh, that it instills a certain dizziness and inability to make sense of it, that people are overstimulated 
and also can't therefore sort out signal and noise very effectively. So 